So it's uh, my uh, uh, pleasure to introduce a friend that I actually met through uh, CLL Ireland at their first um, uh, patient information day. Uh, Dr. Tal Manir um, hails um, originally from Lahore, uh, Pakistan, uh, which is a city that I've been to and enjoyed uh, visiting, actually, um, uh, many, many years ago. But he's now in Leeds and uh, works with Professor Hillman and um, it has in, really is leading some of the most important and quick moving research in CLL. And one of the areas that uh, 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 Dr. Muneer is particularly interested in is combinations. So you saw in Dr. Dubik's, Professor Dubik's talk uh, about the resistance and you heard um, uh, Michael talk a little bit about what happens after you become resistant to ibrutinib. And uh, Dr. Muneer is looking to get ahead of that and seeing are there ways that we can do it. In chemotherapy, combinations are the way to go. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Muneer, who's doing some really creative, innovative, fast-moving research um, at Leeds and uh, collaborating with others through the national health system in the UK in terms of doing important research for CLL patients. Thank you very much. Uh, it's quite a flattering um, kind of introduction, so it's, I have to live up to that. Um, I think the question really is, um, is there a role of combination in CLL therapies? And the way I see it, and I, what I want to do really is to kind of take it down to the backbone of CLL and how, it's, how it develops and why I think that the combination therapy would be, would be the way to go in future. So if you don't mind, if I just use that board actually, just to explain to you where I think essentially your, uh, how the leukemia develops in the first place and why I think that the combinations are the way to go. So I'm just going to move there and then just draw some uh, rubbish diagrams, which I normally do to all, our, all my patients who I see for the first time, because I think that's the easiest way to explain it to you. And then essentially you can understand why I think that the combinations might, the way, might be the way to go. Okay. Do, we have, do we have a microphone? Okay, yeah, that's yeah. So the way um, I tell my patients is that your bone marrow is, is, is a home to a very important cell, which is called the stem cell. And that stem cell has got a fantastic ability to produce three types of cells that you know all know about that. It's the red blood cells, you've got the white cells, and then you've got the cells called the platelets. And all of these cells are produced by the stem cells. It can differentiate into this one, this one, and this one. And the white cells are of different types, and I just chart the two important ones. One are called the neutrophils, and then there are cells that, which are the culprit cells here called the lymphocytes. And there are two types of them, B and T type. And I'll come back to that in a moment, why that is important. So when, this, when the problems happen in, in, in leukemia is that normally a rife of a red blood cell is about three to four um, months. The neutrophils are there in your blood for seven hours and they're gone after that. Lymphocytes, some of them can live for ages, some of them just go away very, very quickly. Platelets three to seven days and you have millions of them. So a stem cell need to do a fantastic job to keep up to date actually as your body needs these cells to be recirculated and produced all the time. And when the stem cell divides back into itself, it can make a mistake. And that mistake in medical world is given a name, mutation. And it's just in the process of where it's getting mutated is where these kind of leukemias develop. So somewhere along the line of production of this B lymphocyte, a mutation happens and a CLL stem cell starts to exist. And when the CLL stem cell starts to exist, normally where our body has got checks and balances there, and body will get rid of that straight away. What happens in leukemia and CLL, and most of the leukemias as well, those checks and balances are abrogated due to some reason, and this cell then starts to grow. So if you consider your bone marrow is like a box, and you are right at the beginning where it's MBL, 
you might have one few CLL stem cells there, but you have a, a lot of normal stem cells there, a lot of normal stem cells there. And these CLL stem cells are producing these CLL cells but not causing any problems. But once you go over a number of years, what happens is that the CLL stem cells will start to grow up and the normal cells will start to grow down. And that's the thing that you see, that the CLL starts to grow up like this in your blood and then it starts moving into the lymph glands and then when the normal stem cells go down, your red cells go down, your normal white cells go down, your platelets go down, and that's what happens that patients become anemic or they become thrombocytopenic, and that's the kind of the normal pathophysiology of the disease itself. So if we go down to what's happening once these CLL cells start to grow, they will start to go primarily in the lymph glands or in the bone marrow. And if you look at the CLL cell in the bone marrow, it's something like a big ball like this. It's got a lot of other cells around it. There are some cells called the T cells. There are some cells which are called the stromal cells, which basically are giving it, it its nutrition or signals. But the signals for the CLL cells to grow come for a, from a very important receptor. And that receptor is called the B cell receptor. And it's something like this. That's the immunoglobulin. And you had a good discussion about the mutated and unmutated. We can go into that in a bit more detail if you want to. But this is the receptor, which is like a signaling molecule. So around these CLL cell in the bone marrow or in the lymph node, there will be some signals that will be transmitted through this. And what it does through a battery of these proteins, like a sick protein, BTK protein, PI3 kinase pathway, what are these? Are These are carrier proteins. They are carrying the signal into the nucleus. And nucleus is where the main decisions are made. That's the headquarter of the cell to decide what to do. And essentially, these signaling molecules will transmit a signal saying proliferate, keep growing. And the other, proliferate, other thing which it will say, don't die. And death in medical world is apoptosis, and that's where venetoclax will come into play, I will tell you in a moment. So these signaling molecules are very, very important, and essentially these are, the, these are the proteins that are blocked by the new molecules. On the surface of the CLL cells are other proteins as well. There's a protein called CD20. That's another signaling molecule. There's another protein called CD19, and I'll talk about it tomorrow. That is an important molecule there. There are other, many others which are important on CD52, lots of them there which are important. But we have utilized to block these proteins <coughs> to send these signals down to the nucleus. And that's where a lot of new drugs, a lot of monoclonal antibodies are working. And lastly, inside the CLL cells, there is another pathway which is active all the time. And that is what we call as the apoptotic pathway. So in the, any cell, there is an equilibrium like this. There are some death proteins which are trying to make the cells to die. And then there are some anti-death proteins. What happens in CLL that your anti-death proteins are too high. And one of that protein is BCL2. And I'll come back to you in a moment. So if you go back to the slides now, I think I'll try to make a bit more sense now. Uh, so the treatment for CLL has actually changed quite a lot. Um, if we look at between 1970 to up to 2010, we had just these drugs, which were chemotherapy-related drugs, chlorambicil, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and then we had the addition of this antibody called rituximab. 
Then we had a new chemotherapy drug called bendamustinrituximab, and then there is a flurry of new molecules here, obinutizumab, ofitumumab, and then arbutinib got its approval. In the relapsed refractory setting, we had a drug called Campath, ofitumumab, um, ibrutinib, idella with rituximab, venetoclax, and acalibrutinib. But the last thing which I want to stress is that in 1970 to 2010, we were using just basic morphology and some flow cytometry, but now we're going down to very deep sequencing in our patients because we are able to look at. So as the treatment has evolved, our techniques to actually pick up um, abnormalities have improved as well. So my next one is where, what is the treatments now at the moment? So the chemotherapy, is the standard old one, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, bendamustine, and chlorambucil. This is quite standard therapy. And what it does is that inside your D DNA here, in the nucleus is, is this machinery called the DNA, these chemotherapy drugs actually bind to the DNA and says to it, stop dividing. But the chemotherapy doesn't recognize which cell is a good one and which one is a bad one. So when it kills the bad cells, that's what we want it to do. When it kills the good ones, it gives you side effects. And over time, it can also damage the DNA to such an extent that actually it can cause other malignancies. So it can induce mutations into the DNA to cause other malignancies. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So the chemotherapy works on this DNA. The Monoclonal antibodies block the CD20 antibody like the drug. So the monoclonal antibodies like um, rituximab and obinutizumab blocks this protein called CD20. And that's, if you combine chemotherapy drugs with this drug, that makes a difference. If you look at other drugs like BTK inhibitors, if you look at the signaling molecule, ibrutinib blocks this protein, and there are four other which I've listed there, tyrabrutinib, acalabrutinib, BJB3111, these are just names of BTK inhibitors. They are blocking the BTK protein. And the PI3 kinase inhibitors are these signaling molecules, which I'd list, say, IPI145 or TGI12208. The other BCR inhibitors are like sick inhibitor. All of this is to block this signal to going down into this nucleus. And if the signal doesn't go, the cells don't divide, and they start to die over time as well, if it makes sense. And then you've got other drugs which work on the immunomodulatory stuff, which actually works on these stromal and T cells, linolidomide, the pro-apoptotic drug, which is venetoclax, it actually binds to this protein called BCL2 and actually shifts the balance towards the death proteins. And what happens is that the cells start to die. And that is one of the very exciting drugs that we've got now. We've got a lot of other drugs which work on the T cells, like the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, and then you've got the CAR T cells, RAR1, or an allergenic transplant. And then you've got new molecules which are coming along at the moment, which we are doing some trials on as well, uh, a different pathway that we are exploring. The problem is that you've got all of that at the moment and how you can use this combination to get the best outcomes for our patients. And that is a very difficult question for the researchers because we've got so many options now by which we can attack CLL. So if I showed you some data which... Um, essentially is the data for chemoimmunotherapy. If you look at the FCR data, this is fludarabine cyclophosphamide, and if you combine a monoclonal antibody like anti-CD20 rituximab, there was a definite improvement in the overall survival. So the median was still not reached at an observation time of six years, and by that I mean that if you give somebody FC chemotherapy at six years time point, 50% of the patients um, will still be in remission, and FCR is even better than that. So clearly, addition of an antibody would made a difference. 
But when we looked into the, really the details of that, we found out that the maximum benefit that the patients were getting were these patients who've got this mutated IgA3. So this receptor, if it is mutated IgA3, then essentially these are the patients who actually benefit the most from this combination. If you look at the bendamustine rituximab, so this was a study done by the German group where they compared FCR versus bendamustine rituximab, they quite clearly showed that the maximum benefit that you get is the patients who are below the age of 65. So above the age of 65, the patients with FCR or bendamustine rituximab, both patients were kind of doing about the same. And the reason why they did that, because FCR is not very well tolerated by elderly patients. And it looks like that above the age of 65, bendamustine rituximab might be a reasonable option. And then came along these very strong NTCD20 antibody, and abinutuzumab is one of the prime example, and there is another one called ofatumumab that just worked slightly differently on the receptor CD20. But the most important thing is this data from CLL11, where people were given chlorambucil with abinutuzumab or chlorambucil with rituximab or chlorambucil on its own. And what I tell my patients that you would expect nearly two and a half years um, remission, about half of the patients will get that with chlorambucil abinutuzumab. So you can see that the median PFS is 26.7 months, which means that about half of the patients will relapse at this time point, and half of the patients will still be in remission. But the important thing to remember is that the median time to next treatment was nearly about four and a half years. So if we give this treatment to patients who cannot tolerate FCR kind of therapy or BR kind of therapy, we can say to our patients that actually you're going to do very well on this combination. And this has become the standard of therapy. Whereas the ofatumumab, the data was Again, about the same two years as compared to 13.1 months with chlorambucil. But everything got changed when we had these new molecules. So these trials, which I was showing you earlier, these were designed before we got the ibrutinib. So this is the brut which inhibits the BTK kinase. Idolisib blocks the BI3 kinase delta pathway. And venetoclax is the drug which inhibits um, the anti-apoptotic protein called uh, BCL2. So I've, just to show you an example why I think the combination therapies are important. So this is a patient of mine who essentially, again, came to us in 2013. Before that, that, that patient was young again. Um, I think she was about 45 uh, when we saw her but she had treatment with fludarabine cyclophosphamide in 2008, and her remission lasted for two, two years, then had bendamustine rituximab, and because the patient was young, they got a transplant at that time, which was the right thing to do at that moment in time. And then the patient came to us, and we got them onto a clinical trial, and the patient continued to be on ibrutinib for 60-plus months, so more than five years on ibrutinib, to a patient who's already is a very bad risk patient because they already had the kind of therapies that we had in the past. This is just a graph of uh, the hemoglobin and platelet count, and all I can say is that improved to near normality uh, for five years, till in 2018, very recently, what happened that she dropped her neutrophil count and her lymphocytes started to go up, and she was clearly starting to have a relapse I did some next generation sequencing on this patient, and I can see that this patient, who already had mutations in the ATM and TP53, has also acquired this BTK mutation as well. And the BTK mutation, once you acquire it at this frequency, which in a female, it is nearly 100% because it's an X-linked uh, protein, so it's uh, going to be nearly 100% of the cells which are showing this. So this is the kind of patient that if I know this result beforehand, I might be thinking about combination therapies earlier on, before I come to this stage where the patient has started to relapse, if it makes sense. So this is the 
kind of my chart of the um, therapies that are being used at the moment. There are some continuous therapies and there are a variety of things that people are using. Combination of chemotherapy, immunotherapy with the new molecules. I wouldn't go into the detail of each and every one. I don't want to tell you all about it, but I think where we need to make sure is look at is all the combinations the same now at the moment. So I've just put down two figures and I, I know it's, it's, it's daunting and it's difficult to understand, but this is the data from two studies and uh, my colleague has already, Professor Dubek has shown you the Resonate data for PFS4, which is progression-free survival on Resonate study. At 24 months, 74% were progression-free. This is another trial called Helios trial and they used ibrutinib with chemoimmunotherapy, bendamustine rituximab. Actually, the curve with the combination looks very, very similar to ibrutinib on its own. So the question really is that, is combining chemoimmunotherapy with ibrutinib is the right thing to do? And at the moment, the data is still not out there. I shouldn't be doing this because this is a comparison between two trials, but clearly it looks like that the patients getting on single agent ibrutinib was doing really as well as patients who got the combination. Similar with idolilisib, this is, um, Professor Dubek showed you this data for idolilisib with rituximab, very good data. There was another trial called Gilead 119, and this is the arm. It looks exactly the same as one, this one. So the PFS was 16.3 months, here it was 19.4 months. They tried exactly the same thing as Helios. They tried idolisib with chemoimmunotherapy, and the median PFS was 20.8 months. So actually, the improvement with chemoimmunotherapy with idolisib, I would argue, was not great. And idolisib on its own would have done the same job. And people are now trying different combinations. You can see that this is the new TGR1202 with ibrutinib. You're getting good overall response rate, but very little um, improvements in the CR or PR rates. This is ibrutinib with another antibody versus ibrutinib on its own. You can say that the overall response rate is better, but look at the median time to response. 1.97 months, this is 3.8 months. We know you need to take ibrutinib long term to get the maximum benefit out of the drug, and the response rates would continue to increase. So, I think it is important to know the logical. And this is quite a revealing study, which was using ibrutinib versus ibrutinib with rituximab. So what you got in this study was better overall response rate in the ibrutinib plus rituximab arm, but actually the curves for improvement in survival or progression-free survival were exactly the same. So the addition of antibody to ibrutinib it's not really making a major difference until unless we use a different antibody and there would be different results which will be coming through. What about venetoclax with rituximab? This is the, uh, the, the drug that kills cell, basically, and you combine it with anti-CD20 antibody. And actually, it does appear that when you combine the drug together, the CRCRI rates is much better as compared to the drug um, when taken on its own. But this is a different group of patients. Um, when they combine this with a stronger antibody, you can see that the CRCRI rate is exactly opposite to this one. So it is a bit um, daunting at the moment that we need to get more data on these molecules and actually a good, good phase three trial will answer that. There is a good phase three trial and this is the data from Murano study in relapsed patients and you can see that at two years that the PFS for venetoclax rituximab arm is much better than bendamustine rituximab. And this appears to be, get, will be getting, it's, it's obviously getting its license based on that. And then it would be head to head with ibrutinib where we would be using this combination. So what's coming at the moment? So this year, I think at ASH, CLL14 would be reporting. This is the German study looking at obinutizumab with venetoclax, and then venetoclax once a day for one year, versus obinutizumab with chlorambucil, which is the standard of therapy, at least in Europe at the moment. And I can tell you who's going to be the winner in this combination, really. It's going to be obinutizumab, venetoclax. So it's uh, uh, definitely going to be 
uh, game changer again. So we will get some data from that. How we are taking it forward is that when I talked about this pathways here, this is the proliferative pathway, which is through the B cell receptor. And the death pathway is, is the apoptotic pathway. And we think that if you combine these two things together, then you get the better responses. So our study is this clarity study, which is already uh, recruited and has partly reported at the moment. What we do is give ivrutinib for first two months to debulk the disease, and then we start venetoclax. And then it's an approach that's taken based on individual patient. So if at six months time point of combination of this therapy, if you are MRD negative, and you must have heard Paula talking a lot about it yesterday, then you stop therapy at one year. So you, essentially, we get patients into very deep remissions and then stopping therapy because I think we would be able to use these combinations again in future. And essentially, what we can do is get patients into so deep remissions that uh, they won't warrant any further therapy with continuous therapy. But there would be patients who actually won't be in MRD negative remission. They continue the therapy for longer. And if at 12 months time point of combination, they are in remission, they continue for 12 more months and then they stop. And then at 24 months time point, if they are positive, they continue with the, um, with the ibrutinib therapy at that time. So it is targeted approach based on individual patient, seeing how individually a patient is responding to that therapy, rather than just following a schedule for every patient. And we had some data now, what I can share with you, that after six months of combination of venetoclax, ivrutinib, uh, 37 patients had an MRD level of less than 0 0.001, uh, which is, in simple layman term, if I take one in 100 million cells, um, 100,000 cells, sorry, that would be fantastic, 100,000 cells, uh, I cannot pick any CLL in, in, their, in their blood. Um, and these are the patients who would be stopping therapy at 12 months, and then we will be monitoring them, and if they start to relapse, then we will reintroduce therapy again at that point. And this is the basis of our big phase three study. So initially when we designed the trial, FCR standard of therapy, and we used ibrutinib with rituximab at that time because that was the flavor of month at that time. We did two small phase two studies, which was Icicle was the one which uh, Jan went into. And then we had an amendment to add abinutizumab, and we had another one for which the data I've shown you with ibrutinib and venetoclax. The winner of all of these was this one. I've reached a venetoclax, and what we've done is we have amended our trial now. We've taken this off altogether because we've got data now to say this is not adding anything else, and we've just added ibrutinib and ibrutinib with venetoclax in combination. So this is the trial which is going to tell us if, um, which combination is the winner at the end, and this is a big phase three trial which is going to recruit 1,500 patients. Uh, we are not doing the only one to do that. There are all going studies in America as well, and essentially this data, this is a combination of abinutizumab, ibrutinib, venetoclax, so kind of targeting the CD20, the proliferation pathway, and the death pathway, all of them together, and what happens, you can see an overall response rate of 100%. This was actually updated in um, EHA, and actually they had MRD negative rates at six months of around 86% of the patients at, uh, in the frontline setting, which was really amazing. Um, and the CLL13 trial, this is the German trial, which is looking at similar questions, similar combinations. So I would just conclude by saying that number of trials exploring the combinations with targeted drugs are looking at to improve the depth of remission. And the best test that we've got at the moment is MRD test. Um, I think it's very important to establish the logical combinations. And we shouldn't be doing trials which are not logical at all, because this is very, very important. And even more important is to attain the long-term data. MRD is a short-term endpoint. What we need to really get is improvement in the PFS and overall survival. So we, our phase three trials should be looking at that question. So we should be looking at FCR, median PFS is six years. So we should be giving ibrutinib for six years at least to our patients to get to that time point. So the trials need to 
incorporate that um, very, very important point. And I think we may be curing some of these patients with these combinations, but only time will tell. And I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs>